first item of business today is general questions. We start with question number one from John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the revised Scottish Wide Area Network project will be completed and delivered in full. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Wide Area Network SWAN is an ongoing programme of work. The contract awarded in February 2014 allows public sector organisations to become SWAN members until February 2020. From February 2020, no new members can join, but existing members can add and revise services until February 2023, by which time the programme will be delivered. SWAN will remain operational until the last member's contract has expired no later than February 2026. I thank John the Scott. Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and he will, I believe, be all too aware of the shortcomings of both the contract with Calcutta and the delivery of IT services thus far, and with the low broadband speeds being delivered. He will also be aware that the day after this question was lodged, an additional £110,000 was allocated to provide extra bandwidth in the service locally. Presiding officer, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when this service will be fully delivered in Ayrshire, why the original contract was so unambitious in terms of broadband speeds, why have delivery dates not been met thus far, have financial penalties been levied or alternative contract has been considered, and is NHS Ayrshire and Arran or the Scottish Government paying for potential cost overruns of this apparently struggling project? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I think that I may have some difficulties in, in getting you to indulge me in giving a full and comprehensive answer to that extent, but I would endeavour to get that information to Mr Scott, and I'm happy to arrange a briefing in which we can go over all these uh, issues and complexities uh, the way forward uh, so that that information can be shared with the member and indeed anyone else who's interested in the network. Question number two, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh report, standards informing delivery of care in rural surgery. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. We welcome the report as a useful uh, contribution to discussion on the sustainability of rural surgical services. The report highlights a number of recommendations which are consistent with the direction of travel for NHS Scotland set out in the National Clinical Strategy. Kate Forbes. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of difficulties of recruitment of surgeons to rural general hospitals. What's the government doing to enhance surgical training and recruitment to ensure an appropriate standard of care to patients in rural hospitals? Cabinet Secretary. In the short to medium term, there are a, a range of actions already being taken to support NHS boards to recruit in remote and rural areas. Um, and also to encourage those who trained or worked in NHS Scotland to return and work in the health service and to encourage others to, to come uh, and work here from elsewhere. So, for example, we are supporting the development of flexible networks between rural and urban hospitals, such as Ragmore and Caithness General. And this is to help maintain and enhance skills where patient numbers are small. And we need to make sure that the skills are maintained uh, by, by those uh, surgeons. The longer term solution really lies in implementing recommendations from the, the Shape of Training report to achieve a, a better balance between general and specialist medical skills. Uh, working with the surgical colleges, proposals are, are well advanced for a, a revised training curriculum that will equip trainees with the competencies to deliver elective and emer emergency general surgery. I think that will be very good news for our rural general hospitals. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the issues which has been raised um, at the Health Committee is in some cases people are not going to rural parts of Scotland because um, their partner can't find work or, for example, broadband connections. Is this an area the government will also look into um, so that we can make sure that rural um, practices and, and actually rural surgery becomes a very attractive uh, career option in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, so Miles Briggs makes uh, an important point, and, and this government has uh, done a lot around broadband and particularly for, uh, for remote and rural areas. And, and he's right, because the, uh, the infrastructure that, particularly in uh, primary care, the infrastructure 
required to uh, deliver some of our enhanced services, looking at the use of technology within uh, rural health care, requires the infrastructure to be there to help deliver that. In terms of the issue of, of partners, that again is a, a, a very important issue that I know boards have worked hard to uh, try to help um, the partner of the, the person coming to work within the health service to also find employment and to offer uh, other uh, incentives, whether that's uh, accommodation or other supports, particularly when someone is going to be new to the area. So these are important issues that surround trying to make sure that we can retain and uh, recruit to our rural areas. And Monica Lennon. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the concerns from the British Medical Association that the erosion of supporting professional activity times and consultant contracts for some areas across Scotland is partly to blame for the chronic shortage of staff and unfilled vacancies that we're currently seeing in rural areas and across the country? And if so, will the government therefore commit to reprioritising the implementation of the 8-2 contract across all health boards as a matter of urgency to make sure that consultants can develop the level of expertise that a world-class health service requires and, and ensure Scotland can continue to attract and retain the best talents? Cameron Secretary. Uh, well, the, this is a, a, an issue that is, has been raised by the British Medical Association with me uh, directly. Uh, what I would say to the member is that the area where this is um, more, more of an issue is actually Greater Glasgow and Clyde, not a a rural uh, health board area. Um, actually, Greater Glasgow and Clyde is, uh, um, is the, the board that has the most 9-1 contracts. So we will continue to discuss with uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, particularly when the, a new chief executive is appointed there, um, that they would that should be one of the issues that they, we would expect them uh, to take forward with the, the consultant uh, workforce within that area. Question number three, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many people are registered with an NHS dentist and how this compares to 2007. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, at uh, 30th of September 2016, there were 4,924,974 people registered with an NHS dentist in Scotland. The equivalent figure for 2007 was 2,669,990. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and it's uh, in, indeed welcome. The Cabinet Secretary will recognise that there remains an in it inequality between deprived and affluent areas in Scotland. Can I ask, therefore, uh, what steps the Scottish Government take to help address child dental health inequalities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to uh, Gil Patterson that uh, we are continuing to make progress in reducing oral health inequalities in children. So, for example, comparing the two years to September 2016 with the two years to September 2007, there's been an increase of 36% in the number of children in the most deprived areas attending their dentist. We do recognise, however, that more work needs to be done, which is why I've decided to expand our flagship Child Smile programme. As announced in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, we'll be expanding the programme to those nursery and primary one and two children in the 20% most deprived areas across Scotland. This programme provides additional oral health interventions, such as fluoride varnish application for children from the most deprived areas of Scotland. I think that will help to make a real difference. Maurice Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While an increase to dental registrations is to be welcomed, it is important to note that the 2016 Dental Report says that because of a change to lifetime registration, the registration rate has become less informative in measuring patient access to dental services. The trend for patients actually seeing a dentist, the participation rate has, and I quote, been falling across all NHS boards, and patients in the most deprived areas are least likely to have seen a dentist in the previous two years. What steps is the SNP government to, taking to ensure that people of all ages aren't just registering, but are actually being treated by a dentist? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, NHS dentistry and the, the transformation in uh, dentistry across Scotland is a success story that we should be immensely proud of. But let me, let me take uh, those questions. Figures 
show um, a significant increase over the last decade in the number of people attending their dentist. Under this government, attendance has risen from 2.5 million in the two years to March 2007 to 3.5 million in the two years to September 2016. So there are more people attending their dentists. And dentists, of course, put considerable work into encouraging regular attendance to give one example, dentists uh, have ex access to the NHS mail system, which allows them to text message patients uh, an appointment reminder, which has been shown to improve attendance. And we should also remember the very important role that the public has to play in ensuring that they, and importantly their children, attend regularly for uh, appointments. Um, so, you know, it should be noted, and um, I would hope be welcomed, uh, that access to NHS dentistry in Scotland is at an all-time high. There is more capacity than ever before to accommodate the needs of patients. Uh, I would have thought that's something that people across the whole of this chamber should welcome. And I saw her. President officer, can I declare an interest that I used to be a practising NHS dentist and my wife continues to practise in the NHS as a dentist. Uh, can I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary for the spin of the week on the dental figures, when in actual fact she's not comparing like for like figures, because the reality is in April 2006 you were registered for 36 months, but now you have lifetime registration. What's more important is actually to look at the participation rates, looking at the proportion of people that access NHS dentistry. If you look at the proportion of people that participate, in September 2006, 99% of adult, adults participated uh, with a dentist that were registered, and 100% of registered children participated at a dentist. That is now 69% of adults and 86% of children. So whilst there is much to welcome, can the Cabinet Secretary still recognise the challenges in dentistry and perhaps give the uh, figures a check-up of their own? Cabinet Secretary. I have never heard such a half-empty glass uh, question in this chamber. Oh, NHS dentistry is a success story. Absolutely. Even Anna Sawa cannot take that away. And I would have thought, given his clinical experience, he would have realised that actually lifetime registration is a good thing because yeah, it keeps people you. registered for their lifetime with a dentist. But let me give him a, f a couple of figures that even he surely can't complain about. The number of primary one children with no obvious decay experience rising from 54% in 2006 to 69% in 2016. The number of primary seven children with no obvious decay rising from 59% in 2007 to 75% in 2015. Even Anna Sarwar surely must welcome those figures. Question number four, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will reconsider removing the Board of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, there should be no doubt that under this government, High will remain firmly in place at the hearts of the Highlands and Islands economy. We have repeatedly committed to maintain the dedicated support which is locally based, managed and directed by High. Phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review will look to deliver for businesses and individuals in the Highlands and Islands uh, additional access and support from national services as part of a more coherent system. Scottish Ministers have asked Professor Lauren Crerer, Chair of High, to lead a governance review working with all four enterprise and skills agencies, their existing boards and other experts, experts in developing the detailed scope, potential structures and functions for the new board. In addition, as I've said on a number of occasions, I'm happy to meet representatives from all parties to discuss the way forward as we consider how best to ensure that High is best placed to meet the challenges and opportunities of the future. David Stewart. <laughs> Uh, President officer, the very simple ask that I make of the Cabinet Secretary today is to retain a fully autonomous board for the Highlands and Islands enterprise, based in the Highlands and Islands, fully responsible for the strategic direction of the organisation. For the Cabinet Secretary to change his mind on this issue at the 11th hour would be a strength, not a weakness, and show the Scottish Government is listening to the wave of public opinion in the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary. 
I think to underline the point that's been made previously that uh, a number of people who have expressed concerns, whether that's the council leaders of the various uh, northern authorities, all of whom I met with yesterday, uh, with Jim Hunter, who's already been mentioned by a number of parties in previous statements, by SNP MSPs who have been the ones that have asked for meetings to discuss their concerns and take the issues forward. I'm continuing to listen to that. But we do await the report from Professor Lauren Creer, currently the chair uh, of High, who will look at the different issues, as well as the fact of what else can be done to strengthen the work of High, whether it's in terms of internationalisation, whether it's in terms of uh, more powers in relation to skills, whether it's in more powers in relation to exports, driving up exports, it's very important that we build on the success uh, of High. Just as we're asking the rest of the agencies within this review to see how we can improve things further to take Scotland from the third uh, decile in terms of the OECD's uh, league tables to the first, it's very important that High also looks at itself, along with others, to see how we can improve the services that we provide to individuals and companies across the Highlands. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm, as he did before in this chamber, that following the conclusion of the governance review, that any decision on the future of the High Board will be brought back to this chamber, and will he re reiterate again his support for the continuation of local decision making? Cabinet Secretary. As Gail Ross mentions, I said during the recent debate on Highlands and Islands Enterprise that I'm more than happy to come back to the Chamber once the governance review is complete. I would again reiterate that the future of High is secure. Highlands and Islands Enterprise will continue to be locally based, managed and directed, providing dedicated support to the local economy. Question number five, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent figures suggesting that Scottish exports to the rest of the UK were four times that of exports to the EU. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes the latest export figures for Scotland. They show that, excluding oil and gas, our total international exports increased by £1 billion in a year, a subject I would have thought for uh, some uh, commendation. Trade with the rest of the UK is hugely important to Scotland's economy and increased by 4.4%. Uh, to 49.8 sorry, to 49.8 billion pounds in 2015. Worth noting that trade with the rest of the EU also increased by 4.4% over that period. And in line with our trade and investment strategy, we are continuing to work with our partners to grow Scottish exports to our key markets. That includes, of course, the UK and the EU, and to support our businesses to exploit opportunities in new international markets. Jamie Green. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, his response. Uh, in a recent uh, PQ to the Scottish Government around these trading uh, values and export numbers, uh, I note in the response that the Government is well aware of the importance of these markets to the Scottish economy. In evidence to the Economy Committee last year, expert witness Professor Mackay said, and I quote, the UK will be Scotland's most important trading relationship and trading partner, and anything that comes between that will have a challenging impact on the Scottish economy. So will the Cabinet Secretary join me in acknowledging that these figures are accurate, that the UK market is worth protecting and put to bed any alternative myths around the importance of the UK domestic market? Cabinet Secretary. I think all those things are evident from the answer I've just given to Jamie Green. I've recognised the size of the trade. It's also worth recognising the size of the trade that the rest of the UK has with Scotland going the other way as well. Very important market. Scotland's an extremely important market to the rest of the UK. But if you look at, for example, the history of the Irish Republic in terms of the exports it had, it managed to achieve substantial advances in terms of its international exports. I'm not sure why that should be a problem for members on the Tory side. We want to increase exports to everywhere, whether it's the rest of the UK, whether it's to the rest of the EU or around the world. That should be a, a, a subject of some consensus between us. And it's also worth saying a 4.4% increase in the year I mentioned, both in terms of the UK is a good thing, but both in terms of the EU, which you don't hear much about from that side of the chamber, is also a good thing for Scotland. And perhaps it would be worth emphasising that positive outcome, that we can build on that, rather than the constant denigration that we hear from the, the party opposite in terms of Scotland's economic yeah. performance. Question number six, Adam Tompkins. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to improve levels of innovative activity in the Scottish economy. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Um, boosting innovation is critical to drive inclusive economic growth. Uh, we are working with our agencies and stakeholders to develop a more innovative and entrepreneurial culture to encourage and support more businesses to become innovation active. 
and to increase levels of research and development supported by our network of innovation centres and interface which facilitates collaboration between businesses and academia. The Innovation Action Plan published on the 11th of January sets out some immediate steps to make a difference to our innovation performance, such as the use of public sector to catalyse innovation in projects such as CivTech, the world's first cross-public sector technology accelerator, and to complement the Manufacturing Action Plan published in February of last year, which sets out a proposal for a National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. Adam Tompkins. I thank the Minister for the uh, part of that answer that I was able to hear. I couldn't hear all of it because of the chorus of approval that greeted the arrival of the Greens in the Chamber. But <laughs> as the, as as the, as, as the Minister will know, the number of um, patent applications filed is used to measure the levels of, innov of innovative activity in the Scottish economy. Yet figures from SPICE show that the number of patents filed per 10,000 head of population in Scotland for 2015 is well below the UK average. The UK Government's newly published industrial strategy recognises the need to build on research strengths in businesses as well as universities. In light of these figures, will the Scottish Government commit to do the same? Well, clearly, um, uh, to give some encouragement to uh, Mr Tompkins, uh, I would indicate that the recent surveys that we've had around um, innovation, UK Innovation Survey 2015, which is UK-wide and is on the same basis as Scotland, has showed that Scotland has had an increase in uh, enterprises with innovation active uh, approach to 50.4%, which is still slightly behind the UK average, but is catching up and is a substantial increase of over 7%. We're also seeing um, great opportunities out of the industrial strategy, and we will work closely with industry to try and maximise those. But just to, to, to in a point about patents, which is a very important issue, not to lose sight of the fact that we have seen a substantial increase between 2014-15, which are last published data, and the data we're seeing from Scottish Enterprise of uh, from 649 to 1,200 innovative, uh, innovation active businesses. So the work that SE and HI are doing to increase innovation in our business community is, uh, I believe, working, and we'll hopefully see progress in due course.